Welcome all to the session on youth changing the world. Uh, we're very fortunate to have three young people with us today who are working in each their own ways and changing the world somehow, and they're all under 25. We have Nora, Risalat, and Sofia with us. And I'll just start with asking each and one of you of presenting yourself and tell, letting us know what you're working on at the moment. Nora. So I'm working on a couple of different things, but I guess what's most interest, mostly interesting to talk about here is the European Youth Parliament. So uh, I'm on the governing body of this organization. Uh, we work in 40 countries with what we call active citizenship uh, education uh, to get young people involved in their societies, informed about governance at different levels. Uh, and it's very exciting. So we have member organizations in, in 40 countries. Uh, we have one here in Norway as well, which is uh, great. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of youth participation, we see it in three different uh, steps. So it's talking about resources, ensuring young people have time uh, and money to participate in, in things, getting them informed about things so that they can build uh, a passion for something, and then in, uh, invitation as a last step. And we work with all these parts uh, to uh, bridge young people um, over um, uh, borders, but also over sectors, uh, uh, an intergenerational dialogue by engaging with different partners, be that business, policy, uh, or otherwise, uh, but really getting young people to, to care about their societies as a first step. Hi guys, uh, glad to be here. Um, one thing is that I'm not under 25, so I don't know if I count as youth anymore. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I count as youth and I'm probably older than you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, uh, for me, I, I hail from Bangladesh um, and like I grew up with, uh, in an environment where my dad really instilled, as an environmental activist, he instilled a lot of early values. Um, but as I, as I grew up, I studied it more, I kind of uh, branched out into realizing that these are the challenges that we face uh, in our generation, uh, in the world, are only solved on a global scale. Like we need to have the kind of global dialogue and global solutions. Um, so, uh, so despite being from a small country, I, I have kind of applied uh, my career in, in going towards international uh, systems and how we can affect them in ways uh, to come together to uh, really solve the challenges that we, we face. Um, so uh, the way I do that in, in terms of my day-to-day -day work is with an organization called Avaz, uh, which is a global civic movement and uh, campaigning organization that uh, uh, some of you may have heard of. Um, and I work as a campaigner there. And uh, essentially, uh, mostly I, I, I spend my time on uh, climate and environmental challenges, but also kind of uh, citizen-driven uh, campaigning and uh, any any public interest work uh, that needs to be done on the international scale. Um, and, and I see uh, in terms of social movements and uh, uh, the kind of changes we need to make, I see youth as playing a fundamental role because I think uh, they, they can really drive the agenda forward through having a deep moral core of like what we need for a generation. Uh, we can disrupt things. Youth can really uh, disrupt and push the boundaries of conversations, uh, as well as uh, use kind of new technologies and uh, new ways of uh, you know uh, innovation and uh, thinking uh, that can kind of be applied to to uh, older problems. So um, so happy to build on that further. After. Hi, my name is Sofia, and uh, I'm from Ukraine. And a year ago, I started a company in Ukraine called Connect Ukraine, where we help uh, startups develop, it's an accelerator and as well as consultancy for startups and we help connect them to uh, foreign investors. But I think what's uh, very interesting and important is the fact that young people, the biggest disadvantage that we have is our lack of connections. The older you get, the more experience you have, the more connections you build. Young people, because just purely of their age, they don't have these connections. So what we try to do is we try to uh, encourage young people to always uh, meet new people, f uh, foreigners, Ukrainians, and just try to connect them so they can start their own businesses uh, and engage in the environment in any way. Yeah. And I want to bring, bring this conversation a little bit back to the one we had previously with the Prince EI. Uh, 
Um, he talked about the importance of knowing yourself and what drives your action. You're three highly motivated young people who are driving action and not only uh, implementing it yourself, but having an influence on a lot of others. What is it that drives you personally? What's your main motivation? I mean, for me, I've always cared about social injustices, but I've also been realistic in my approach. The thing that I can do alone is not the same as what I can do with other people. So what drives me is finding people, whether they uh, agree with me or not, and building uh, platforms. So um, you could say that I'm an activist in a platform. I, I don't convey my opinions on others, but I try to uh, engage other people in the same discussions that I'm having. Uh, and I think that's a first step. Um, so my parents were activists when they were younger, and that's one way you can take uh, to address, for example, social injustices. But the approach I took is if I can educate enough people about their societies and their rights, they themselves can also claim uh, their rights and, and those of others. So um, I'll say two things on that. I think one is, so I, I really actually resonated a lot with how uh, Prince EA kind of, uh, shared uh, his philosophy, and uh, that, that resonates a lot with mine. Um, I, I do think like, I see it more as kind of a, a way of being, and like, uh, uh, I think our, our worldview is kind of what underpins our actions. And, and uh, just from, uh, from, again, like resonating with your experience as well, like my, my dad being an activist and kind of instilling those values, I think it's just the natural expression of those values in my work. Um, and and I'm, I'm really deeply fortunate to be able to find to have found a home uh, where I really feel passionate about like applying these, uh, you know, uh, applying them in a way that uh, feels true and authentic. Mm. Um, so, so I think I think that's a, that's a gift, and and I think I, I would want for everyone, and I would hope for everyone to to find that and not give up, um, and and really find uh, what truly calls you in your expression in the day to day. Sorry. Uh, I, I also have a background where my family, my father and my mother were activists, so I definitely, I think, got it from them. <laughs> um, however, I think for me, what keeps me going, what always encourages me to, to want to do more is because when you just sit down and talk to people, uh, especially for me in Ukraine, whenever I talk to Ukrainians, they're always so full of ideas. Young, old, everyone, they're full of ideas and they're just too scared to actually go ahead and make something of these ideas and that's that's what I try to do is I try to encourage people to move forward to actually start doing their own thing and I think that's what drives me it's just listening to these people listening to these amazing ideas and understanding that there's so much we haven't yet discovered so much that we haven't yet done and there's just so much potential in this world and on that, Sophia, because it's very true, the power that lies in all the ideas of youth is amazing. How do we help youth go from ID to action? And how do we also engage youth who perhaps do not have parents that are activists and who perhaps uh, don't necessarily come from a background that uh, gives them the opportunity to take that space in society? Um, was the question directed at Sophia? No, it's to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you have to find the places where people are. And for young people, mostly, uh, that's schools. Uh, so what I do and what we do is we work very closely with the educational systems uh, to be able to inform young people about these possibilities. Mm. Uh, and it's, you don't have to care about everything. You can find a passion in one issue. Mm. And that's what we're trying to instill also in our members. We discuss everything from um, uh, the EU cohesion policy uh, to agricultural issues to um, uh, foreign uh, interventions in other parts of the world, uh, sustainable energy. And if someone just finds one interest and uh, it sparks an interest in working with that issue, we're happy. Mm. You don't have to work with all issues at the same time. True. You want to go? Should we vary it up the, uh, the kind of <laughs> one by one? <laughs> I, I can go as well. Um, so um, I think I think it's about relating uh, to what people do care about, right? Like people, uh, young people uh, as well. So I'll just um, give a couple of examples. So over the last few weeks, um, 
many might have seen this in the news, uh, there has been a lot of agitation in the streets of Bangladesh uh, about, uh, so it, it, it sparked off with an uh, incident where two students were killed in a kind of bus runover. Um, uh, so, so young people frustrated with the kind of state of the roads and how many people die uh, in accidents every year and, and the, their safety kind of came into the streets in massive, massive numbers and uh, really uh, agitated for change. They uh, were peaceful. They actually kind of uh, checked drivers for their own licenses and kind of, you know, took things into their own hands. And they really inspired the whole country uh, to, to kind of uh, basically show them how it's done, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone was saying that, yeah, like our school and college students, many under 18, are kind of really showing how it's done. Um, so, so I think, you know, like that's, that's something, safety is such a, such a basic issue, right? But it, it kind of went to a level where people were like, all right, we need to take matters into our own hands, like young people did that. So, um, so I think there are, there are many issues that young people care about, and uh, it's, it's about finding what's, what's relevant right now and engaging in that conversation and not, rather than shutting them out, kind of having that space to kind of carry that forward. And if I may add to that, the way that uh, this information, the way that the situation was spread, it was all over the media. Uh, there were hashtags, there were people following uh, just through social media, and I think that's also an advantage that we have nowadays that we didn't have in the past, that young people should definitely use to expand uh, their networks and also educate themselves. So, it's, uh, of course, education, school system is very important, but also going outside the school system and trying to, to figure out on your own what would you like to do. Yeah, I couldn't important. agree more because that's exactly what I work with and why I'm actually moderating this panel with you. I do believe that educating um, youth outside of the school system and giving them the tools and knowledge and actually the skills to succeed in the future that are not giving in the school at the moment. We're speaking in this event about the future and one thing we're not addressing is that the school system is not providing the actual skill set that is necessary for both personal success and taking space in society. Um, yeah. So I'm going to mention my company, which is Interbridge, <laughs> and that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Enough self-promotion. You, <laughs> you wanted to say something. You should check her initiative out. It's, it's very inspiring. But I definitely agree with you, and that's our approach. We, we don't contact schools saying we, we're going to do what you do. We say, this is what you're not doing, and yes. that's mm -hmm. why we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, learning outside the classroom, classroom mm -hmm. or uh, learning inside the classroom, but not through school, uh, it's so important. Mm -hmm. um, but I would also say, and this is something we have to be frank about, the opportunities for everyone, are, are they're not alike. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a financial burden very often to get engaged in anything. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something we're tackling with, the, with our partners. So we work with the UNHCR, for example, to get young migrants and refugees to participate in our events. Uh, we try to get our partners support, to support us in our work with the mobility fund so that uh, travel costs are not an issue. Uh, so that uh, your participation in our events, uh, it, it, it shouldn't be limited by your financial situation mm. uh, and, uh, or by your parents' financial situation, which is what it actually is. So mm. this is something we have to work <laughs> very, very focused on mm. uh, and where we need a lot of uh, partners to, to support us in this mm. mission uh, throughout uh, different sectors and uh, approaches. So absolutely, no matter background and no matter social class that every child and young person growing up today has a spot in society and can do their share. You are mentioning some of the resources that you lack. I'm wondering for you, what is it you lack in your work to actually be able to create the impact that you want to create? Um, so I, so I, I have been very fortunate uh, to have you know, had access to an education uh, that really uh, so provided me with a solid foundation. So, so for me, uh, I, I will speak less for myself and more build on what you were saying, because I think, I think that, that question of access and basically ensuring that the, uh, the young generation as well as uh, kids right now get uh, a solid footing for the world, the rapidly changing world that we have is fundamentally important because mm -hmm. like, so, so we, can, we can look at it from two sides. Mm -hmm. One is, the potential of what that could unlock uh, and the dangers of what uh, missing out on that opportunity will, will create. Mm -hmm. So uh, on, the, on the potential side, 
we are really facing, like, you know, this whole conference is about the future of everything. And it does feel like, you know, everything is kind of in flux. Like, uh, the climate is changing. Like, we are potentially living through a sixth extinction. Uh, we are, you know, our natural living systems of the planet, you know, need, need care. Um, like, the nature of jobs is changing. So biotechnology, like, you can, you can name so many different dimensions. So if we don't prepare the youth and younger generations, to uh, deal with these changes in a productive way, the, uh, like we need, like we can unlock, we can channel these forces into into a positive, creating a better world. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, if we don't, what that results in so is high levels of unemployment, and uh, you know, like when a young population that has a lot of disruptive energy but is frustrated and doesn't have a productive outlet, that really seeds the kind of uh, rising extremism and stuff like that that we see. Uh, so, so it's you know we we have to choose between these two paths. There's no middle ground, uh, and and you know I I very much see. I think we can all see that one is better than the other. And actually, just to uh, give an actual number, in such a rich country as Norway, it cost the state 15 billion Norwegian kroners for all the children who fall out of the system. So not kind of. Uh, working with it in a preventive way and having kids finding, uh, first of all, their spot in, in schools and in jobs and then also being active uh, members of society costs a lot. So thank you very much for approaching it from both potential and also challenge. And now for all three of you, what is really nice to see with all different aspects that you have. So, uh, Nora, you work more on maybe perhaps a bit of an institutional level with having influence on governments. And you work with the activist environmental approach and you work with youth and business. How is it welcomed by governments to have youth engaging with them? What are your different experiences with that? And how do you feel that your voice is actually counting or not counting? So me personally, I work in an institutional way outside the UAP. So I work in, in expert groups with the, at, at the UN uh, or through my government, uh, because for me, that's the platform where I think that I can achieve change. Uh, but I don't think that has to be the platform for everyone. So that's why I also think civil society, uh, through engaging people in different issues, uh, provide a platform uh, where young people can choose <laughs> uh, the way uh, they want to engage later. Um, but going back to your question, um, I think there is an interest. I just don't think there is always <laughs> a, a clear solution, but ask young people how they would like to be engaged and perhaps don't treat them like one group who have one opinion, like one young representative in a room is not solving the issue. Getting those rooms to be more inclusive towards young people, towards uh, minorities, towards women, that's the approach. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, there isn't one clear solution, so then nothing happens. Uh, but you need to tackle complex issues uh, with the with a plethora of, of, of solutions. <laughs> so I just want to build on that and like take this opportunity to really acknowledge and uh, admire the work that Future Talks has done, because you know there are hundred people that are being brought together from all over the world, from forty two countries. But the 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 diversity of ages, like there are uh, people as young as like eighteen and so on, uh, and and a lot of uh, people, young people, have been given a platform. So, uh, so I think I think I just want to acknowledge that as part of this event that we're in right now, uh, and I think that's really important because we need like uh, we need fresh thinking to come at a lot of the challenges that we face. Like, uh, what's that quote? I'm probably going to paraphrase it. Uh, it's uh, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that uh, you know generated the problem in the first place. Um, so, so young people, you know, look at things not within the kind of constraints that maybe. Uh, others who have been looking at it for a long time already face, so they can they can come at it with new lenses and new ideas. Um, so so it's really important to have that intergenerational conversation of like what it what it really means and what it takes to kind of uh, uh, create the world that we that we need. Um, and and young people will always engage whether it's on the streets or whether it's on the you know table. But uh, when it's uh, a seat at the table, that gives. Uh, uh, when it's more inclusive conversation that gives more of a chance uh, for those voices to be heard and uh, deliberated in a way that's productive uh, as well. 
Uh, I want to speak from two perspectives, from the perspective of UAE, which is where I live right now, and also Ukraine, and how the government uh, doesn't really support a young people project. And in Ukraine, it's very difficult to, uh, to start a project as a young person. There's uh, people always doubting you. There's people always assuming that you're going to mess up, that you're, y you just don't have enough experience. And it's very similar in the UAE. Uh, in the UAE, I would say even more so, because it, something you should understand, I'm 19 years old. So when someone 19 goes into a government building or anywhere and says, hey, I want to start this project, they'll laugh me off and then just tell me to go away. And I think that is a really, really big issue that we have right now because so many ideas are being generated by young people and so many ideas are being suppressed by the government, by the older generations. And I'm, I'm not saying obviously not all these ideas are great, but with the rejection of these ideas just purely based on age, you lose a lot of uh, potential great changes that could happen in this world. And I, I don't want to just <laughs> speak negatively, that was very negative, but, and, but you know, people, the, th the great thing about young people is that, yes, there are governments, like the Swedish government, like the Norwegian government, that really tries to listen to the opinions of young people. On the other hand, I'm sure the Bangladesh government, the Ukrainian government, not so much so. Young people, one way or another, will find a solution and we will go either against them, demonstrate against them. That's how uh, the revolution in Ukraine in 2014 was started, in 2013, sorry, by students coming out and protesting against the government. Or you can work with the government and ideally with, but no. Depending <laughs> on the situation. Well, <laughs> that's also <laughs> true. <laughs> And yeah. it's very true, yeah. and, and yeah. you've kind of given like the absolute extreme of what can happen. However, when youth is invited into conversations, how can we educate um, the grown-ups that are inviting these youth into the conversation with somehow good intentions to not make the youth voice be a token, to not just have it there as a nice decoration and as like something nice to have, but an actual relevance um, a relevant source to how to solve issues that involve us all and will involve the younger ones even more so than the adults because they're going to grow up into the consequences of it. Two things. I think already if you're at the table, you're in a privileged position. And what, I, what I try to do is say, can I bring three people that I know that are working on these different issues that you're not covering here and that I don't know anything about? So being a door opener because you're already at the table uh, and the second thing is, now I lost it, um, I'll get back to it after you guys. But I think if you're in that privileged position, then do make, make other people join you. Uh, um, I think, so in, in the political system, we see this a lot. Like there's a, there's a pressure to kind of answer to the constituents and say, I know the answer, right? Uh, but the truth is, like, we don't. There's a lot of challenges we face that we don't really know the answers of, and we have to figure it out together. And I think the first step is for us as uh, engaged, uh, you know, engaged citizens to kind of firstly be okay with that answer. Like, you know, that understand for ourselves that yes, there are a lot of unknowns about the future, a lot of uncertainties. And also, uh, you know, for politicians and for leaders to be able to say that I don't know this answer right now, but I'm gonna do my best to have an inclusive dialogue about figuring it out, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that first step is that admission of, you know, like we actually are up against really, you know, difficult challenges that we need to find answers to. Uh, and, you know, there's one, one uh, example that comes to mind which I find fascinating, which is that if you give uh, kids in uh, kindergarten the, uh, what is that called, the marshmallow challenge, yeah. uh, they kind of find like, crazy solutions and they find like so many creative like ways of kind of solving that. Uh, but if you actually give it to someone who's maybe past high school, uh, they can't. So even among young people, like kids are so creative. Um, so, so, so valuing that creativity and valuing fresh lenses, uh, I think, uh, you know, but with, with the knowledge and admission that we actually have to uh, look at things and come up with solutions together and like welcoming that creativity in that place. And I'll ask you for your opinion, but do you think any of it can be bridged into the business world, since you work with that? 
I, I do believe that we're always going to have a problem as long as we're talking about the young generation versus the old generation. It's only when we actually mold the two together will it be a real solution. And I think it's important to remember, yes, we are young, we have less experience, we're just out of high school, we just started our thing. So it is important to listen to the older generations. It is important to uh, learn from their mistakes, especially that's the most important thing, is to learn from their mistakes and not repeat them because we'll just be doing the same thing. So I think as much change as young people are doing, should be doing, we should never forget to always uh, take advice, to always understand that we have been in this world for less time and we have not experienced it as much as others. Um, but in the business world, I, sorry, what was the question again? I'm so sorry. <laughs> How the business world can actually implement um, the voice of youth in creating solutions for themselves. I mean, many of them are creating products and services who will very soon be for the younger generation and they might not even have the lenses that are needed to create the right product or even take into account the, the, the activism around climate and the fact that the younger generation might buy products in a different way. So how they can use youth also in their own business development. Uh, yeah, and I think that's, uh, that's um, important to always have uh, young people in the classic businesses, the classic big giant businesses. However, I, I also believe that right now we have an opportunity that we never had before with the growing startup uh, world, the startup community. There's so much more potential now for young people to do, make a difference, to do things. Whereas before it was, you know, you had to become an accountant, then you would move up the ladder and then you'd finally be a CEO or whatever you'd like to be. Whereas now you can, you know, there's so many cases of students who've never finished high school and they do something, not encouraging that, but, you know, so <laughs> something like that. So I think we have so many opportunities and I think it's important to remember. And there's so much being provided that we just need to look a little further and actually see, like, oh, there's uh, this organization that helps uh, young people students develop their own business ideas. There's this that helps them be in government, you know? There's, yeah. So I want to acknowledge the uh, perhaps uh, older ones in the room who are willing to listen to what the youth say, but the absolute last question, I want you to provide the young people who are sitting here looking at you for your activism, activism and what you have done so far, and provide them perhaps with um, some guidance or a tip on if they have something they're really passionate about, how can they create the most impact? So quickly, I would say find like-minded people and get together and do things uh, together or find organizations who work with things uh, that you're interested in and dare to try different things um, because you might not know what your interest is uh, at the moment. Uh, but the previous UN Deputy Secretary General, Jan Eliasson, says that together is the best road we have, uh, and I agree with him. Um, I'll just say don't give up. <laughs> That's just kind of life advice uh, in the sense that, you know, if you look at anyone, anyone's story who has done really meaningful things in the world, like, you know, they didn't give up. Like, they got rejected for funding like a hundred times, and then they got one funding, and then it built like a multi-billion dollar company. And, so, so don't, you know, don't give up and you know, really kind of persevere in what feels authentic and true. I'll keep it short. Stop talking and start acting. Just do it. And I will say let's clap for that <laughs> and clap for everyone in the panel. <laughs>